Over 100 Boko Haram commanders and fighters surrender to the Nigerian army in Borno State. However, how repentant are these bandits? And reactions are still trailing the interview done by former military head Brahim Fabangida. Of course, uh, we'll be having conversations on that. Stay with us because this is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anna Cole. Another Chibok girl has been rescued from captivity. Borno State Governor Baba Ghana Zulum has announced uh, he, the rescued girl, Rus Bogu, uh, returned with a Boko Haram fighter husband and two kids she delivered while in captivity. According to a statement signed by Zulum's spokesperson, Ruth and her apparently repentant husband surrendered themselves to the Nigerian military on July 28 at a location in Bama. In April 2014, we remember that about 276 students of the government's girls' secondary school in Chibok, Borno State, were kidnapped by Boko Haram terrorists. And still, on this Boko Haram terrorist matter, the Nigerian army says top Boko Haram commanders and fighters, along with their families, have surrendered to its troops in Operation Hadin Kai. Well, joining us to discuss this is uh, Dennis Amakri. He's a former assistant director of the DSS. And we're also being joined live uh, by telephone uh, by Chinedu Ohonda. He's a retired colonel. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Great. Uh, um, colonel, I'm going to start with you because you're a retired um, colonel in the army. And then we're talking, obviously, about how the army um, is processing these so-called repentant Boko Haram members. Now, I'd like to take your mind back to uh, earlier this year where the same Nigerian army complained about Boko Haram members who were given some form of amnesty and pardon who still went back as informants to Boko Haram. So the first question is, how, do these, how are these men processed when they come and say they're repentant or they have deserted Boko Haram and they're asking for some form of mercy? What should be the process in which these people are... And I know that, you know, for different uniformed organizations, there are different processes. But for the army, is it a thorough job that is being done when these men show up and say that they're repentant? Connell, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Yes. That's Go, ahead. Slight, so. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. No. Yeah, am I to comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, those commanders that they claimed have surrendered to the army, and the army happened to have taking them on this thing, and they even came with one of the cheaper girls, and they are asking for forgiveness. Well, the truth is that if they have been, they have surrendered, they ought to go for what they call questioning, what they call intelligence questioning, to know more about the details where they are surrendering, and what is in their plans to surrender? Why is it that they are surrendering? Let them know. But the truth is that if they have come to plead and they want to Nigeria as a country to forgive them and so on, they ought to undergo some questioning. First of all, to know their strength, where they are, the number of girls that they captured, how many of them that are still alive, those that are there, where are they? Have they dismembered some? Have they moved from one location to the other? So all put together to get this event in a question of just apologizing, asking for forgiveness. No, that shouldn't be the basic. Which the governor also, you know, the governor took one of the girls that has 
two kids now mm -hmm. for him and to the parents. And if join the parents of uh, of uh, the girl and the girl has, you know, joined their parents and so on. So mm -hmm. most of the time to ask questions, is it truly what is supposed to be? So our God, our military should capitalize on what they will get out of the uh, uh, the those so people that are surrendered. Yes. They should know exactly what to do and know their locations and so on. So that this question of uh, surrendering and uh, asking for forgiveness to come up and let them know exactly what to do. Let me let me let me push you. Um, the acting um, general officer commanding um, seventh division and the commander yes. of sector one, Brigadier General Abdul Wahab Adelokun, um, during his visit to the um, to the Boko Haram um, enclave, or rather where the Boko Haram members were received, I'd like to just quote exactly what the reports say. Uh, he said that. The decision of these men to drop their arms and come out first is highly commendable. He also goes ahead to say that they should also try and talk to their brothers and colleagues in the forest to come out and embrace a new life of peace and rehabilitation. He also spoke through an interpreter, which we know um, because these people do not necessarily speak English. But then we also record that these men got some form of donations from the army. They distributed new clothes, assorted food, groceries, and toiletries to the terrorists and their families. I'm really thinking about it. If it were, if it were anywhere else in the world and a group of terrorists who have killed many people for over a decade, slightly over a decade, show up, do you think the US army, or let's not even go too far, just around the corner, would be giving them food items and giving them clothes instead of questioning these people, where they have been, what they've been up to, and why they're here. But what we see is more of a welcome party. So I'm still probing. Why is the army not doing the necessary? And why are we having su such a, a media parley of sorts where they're giving terrorists and their families Food and clothes. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they can't do it, but should that be the first thing that is being done? Let's keep the governor out of this. The governor is not a military person. He does not understand the processes of debriefing or trying to interrogate, a, you know, a terrorist. But should this be what is making our headlines today in a country where we're facing this kind of terrorism? Well, uh, you can't say the army is not doing the necessary things. Uh, because uh, the army, there is a, a department that ought to call the man, not really arresting him, but putting him in a better situation and getting more information from him. And I believe the army will be doing that. They, they will not just release him or let him walk away like that. They will have to rehabilitate him, keep him together and ask and ask some pertinent questions that they will use in further working. So I believe the army will do that. It's not that they will just leave him like that. And that is it. Uh, let me come to you, Mr. Macri. Um, you obviously work with the DSS or worked with the DSS and you are a security expert. Um, questions have come up as to why we have so many of these men coming back. And you know the saying, once bitten, twice shy, we should be very security conscious as to the fact that these people, we have had people like this show up and say that they're repentant and still take info and intel to the guys wherever they are in the forest. Why should we trust this, sis? And the same question I asked Connell, why are we somewhat welcoming them with clothes and food? These men are terrorists, repentant or not. Uh, we are not supposed to welcome them. We are not supposed to welcome them because this has happened before. Before Governor Zulum came into power, there was another governor, I can't remember his name off head, but there was this um, uh, 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 kidnapped girl who came in with her husband, a terrorist who married her, apparently raped her and then converted her into his wife. At that time, nothing was really done, but 
they welcomed the girl, and after some days, I think the man ran back into into uh, Boko Haram uh, enclave. So now that we are having this same thing repeat itself, I think there should be some kind of procedure whereby you process these people very well. They cannot kill people and do all kinds of things, and then when they come, we open. I know, I know that we are battle weary. We've been fighting this for more than a decade. And they are also very, very tired and despondent. That's why they are uh, uh, coming out to come and surrender. But we have to be very, very careful. Where are the arms that they surrendered with? I didn't see any arm. Instead, they came in there with placards and the placards some of them are illiterate, and this is well-written English saying, Nigerians, please forgive us. Who wrote it? Do they interpret it for people to write, or how did this come about? See, we don't want to give any benefit of doubts to what is happening here. It is a good omen that terrorists are surrendering, but let them surrender properly if actually they are surrendering but we don't want to have them come in here under the cover of some kind of guys, and then tomorrow, the next thing you see them attacking, because then you take them into your house and then you never know what they can do to you. I'm also curious as to the um, mindset or the psychological state in which the girl that has returned and her children are in. Uh, because they've been away for, for years, I mean, and, and she's now a woman, she's not a girl anymore. And we have also seen in the years, over the years, that there have been girl bombers. We have seen girls come and bomb in different parts of the Northeast. Um, so again, I, I, and I'm not in any way trying to propound any theory, but... What processes should this girl go through too? I mean, she needs to go through a psych evaluation, but how are we certain that this girl has also not been brainwashed? And let's also talk about what should be done to these men, especially those who have, the, the one who showed up as her husband, who probably slept with this child when she was underage. Um, shouldn't he be undergoing some form of jail time for... Um, child molestation, and he's also, on the, on the one hand, a terrorist. Well, the thing is this, for the girl, when uh, she comes there, I think they will take her out for some kind of psychological evaluation, um, you know, rehabilitation, and then, of course, talk to her a lot. Uh, the security agencies, especially the DSS, will have a lot to gather from this girl, because she's been with them for years. She knows exactly what is going on there. But for the guy, uh, that, that man is a fighter. He's been there. I think, number one, they should isolate him. Isolate him. And then, of course, debrief him properly. Just like what the colonel said. You know, debrief him. And then, of course, ask him pertinent questions. And uh, because he is a big source of information to the security agents, you know, now that he has come out. And for the rest of them, I think they should all be quarantined somewhere and then interrogated one by one. You don't bring them and start giving them food and clothes and everything and then make them feel like as if, let's go back, later we'll come back again, you know. I, I, don't, I don't like that approach of uh, what's going on right now. One more question before I go back to the corner. I also noticed that in all of this conversation, the man was just referred to a man as a man. We do not know who he is. We don't see his face. We can't tell who exactly he is, but we see a picture of the other men who have surrendered somewhat and their families. We've heard that they have families. Of course, the families might be you know, behind the cameras, but who are these men? Can we name them? Can we trace... Again, I think I'm going to have this discussion is going to have to go back to the corner, but I'll ask you. All of these other men that we rehabilitated and gave them some form of um, amnesty, why have they not been able to trace or tell us where they came from? Why have they not been able to take the army to where they are, where the main people are? 
Look at this group of people trained with taxpayers' monies, rehabilitated some of them, and even half of them went back. So why have these people not necessarily been able to take us to where these Boko Haram members are, at least their enclave? Well, congratulations to the army. We hear that um, you know, the Boko Haram leader was finally killed. But we need to be able to find these other people. Why is it taking so long? I may, be not, I may not be in the army, but I mean, we're curious. These are questions that people are asking. It is, uh, it is, I think that is part of the process that I think the army is going to go through. You know, I believe strongly that the commanders are going to go through that. You know, but isolate them, get all the information you can get from them, get all their names, you know, and which part of Nigeria they came from. Because some of them might even be foreigners. And if they are foreigners, arrange for, you know, deportation to their various governments. So there is a lot of processes to be carried out you know, under this particular situation. Mm. And I, I hope that the military is doing that. Back to you, Colonel. Um, let's talk about the fact that just, just as uh, um, Mr. Macri has raised, we have the guns that have been running through the Sahel, and we know that even the bandits, most of them are not Nigerians. Um, of course, when we profile these people, we'll definitely know those who are insiders and those who are outsiders. Again, it could be that the Boko Haram fighters have had their resources depleted and loopholes have been plugged so they cannot have access to food, they cannot have access to the things that they used to have. And this could also be a strategy to get food. I mean, look at the first thing we gave them, food. How are we dealing with this issue of, you know, the arms um, struggle around the Sahel? Don't forget, the U.S. Senate recently put a pause to the sale of arms and the, you know, the helicopters um, to Nigeria. Um, if, for example, the army wants to move in on Boko Haram, how do they go about it? Let's also not forget that their arms and ammunition are more sophisticated than what we have. Well, uh, if it's clear that they have cut off their line of communication, which means they won't be getting logistics and other things that they will use in prosecuting the war. The best the army can do is to know their present location, know their strength, know exactly what they are made up of. You know, especially those are the mistake the army kept making, or the, 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 my colleagues have been making, is this question of kicking them and giving them shy and so on, what we call shy, you know? And later they go back to their, uh, to their domain to attack, knowing fully well the, 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 the army has good. So what we expect is that they should be isolated and certain pertinent questions will be asked. And that which should be used to locate where they are and this is, the army has all the equipment to use. Do they? Do they really they have, have the equipment? Because we're still expecting more equipment or you know ammunition from the U.S. Uh, from, we, I mean, there has yes, been a sale. Yes, I mean but when you say we have all the equipment, equipment do we really can, have it? You see, they can have the general survey of where they are and know exactly what to do. They use the uh, the, 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 the the air force and the infantry men to. Attack the players are not exactly what they are doing. So, whether we like it or not, the army knows what to do. Except they are using team groups to, 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 to just perpetrate this work going on. If not, they know exactly what to do. With this present, like, it is very obvious and sure that they have cut off their lines of communication and they require a lot of this thing. So I want to quote again what the army chief said. He said the Nigerian army has resolved to intensify its both a kinetic and non-kinetic approach towards the ongoing fight against insurgency in order to leverage on the, on, uh, on the knowledge of Musa Adamu and Usman Adamu, uh, also with the current wave of turnout by terrorists to enable her, that's the army, achieve both short and long-term counterinsurgency gains in the Northeast. So explain to the layman what these count kinetic and non-kinetic means. Well, you see, whatever the chief said, what I, I know there is an ongoing war, ongoing 
uh, in caution against the uh, bandit, against both in Zamfara and the uh, northeast. So they must continue the, the, the momentum, and the momentum must continue that must be high by the district. So let them see what the, the information they can gather, because those are the primary and the positive way of doing things. You see, we can't just execute them because we have seen them, they have surrendered to the people and so on. But they should be careful in holding them, knowing exactly what they want and how to go about their decision. Interesting. Um, I mean, I, I want to go back to the issue of, you know, the kidnap of these girls and the kidnaps that are continuously happening. Let's not forget that Kaduna seems to have been become a target of sorts. Uh, and then, of course, it's still happening. Schools have been um, getting these bandits coming in and out. And let's not forget that the bandits also are totally different sets of people, a different sets of terrorists from Boko Haram. Now, I saw a video, I can't remember who sent me that video, of the state of these schools where these students have been kidnapped or are being kidnapped. And I, I, I really can't remember who sent me that video. And, and the person said something like, these are students waiting to be kidnapped, obviously, because the schools didn't look like it had a wall. You know, the children were obviously naked and open to, you know, whatever, whatever threats that could come, especially at a time like this where schools education is being a target. So, uh, Mr. Macri, what can government do? Because especially the government of President Buhari, they came on the wings of putting an end to this scourge this insurgents Boko Haram but now we have a hydra headed monster and they have they come under all kinds of names on Un unknown gunmen bandits there's Boko Haram on one side I mean it's a lot so what why what is government going to do let I mean the army already has its plates full what is government doing deliberately we've not heard anything since after the senate put um you know its foot down to say they're not selling more equipment to us because they want to be certain that our army uh, is not in any way using those arms and ammunition against his own people. And um, they cited cases of human rights abuses. What is our government doing to push to show that this war that they're fighting, they want to win it? Uh, well, when you look at the schools um, and how dilapidated they are, you know, it shows that um, somebody has neglected uh, those schools. Now, when you... Uh, also, think about what uh, the United Nations have come up with, which is the Safe School Initiative. Um, that is something that um, I think uh, we should have grabbed with uh, both hands. It was started with about $10 million, and then after that, uh, the, the contributors, the government itself was supposed to contribute and some other organizations. But you find out that the schools have been there, laid bed, no perimeter fencing, no, um, no gates, no lights. In fact, the, the video you're talking about where there are no doors in some of the um, dormitories, you know, is a situation that is really horrifying. So what governments can do, and I think the Kaduna State Government have started it, they have chosen some schools. Right now, all schools are closed, about 5,000 of them in Kaduna State. And then, right now, they've chosen some schools where they are strengthening, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in fact, uh, what do I call it, hardening the security system of those schools. Now, when they finish, I don't know whether they're going to decide on whether they want to do mega schools where most of the students are going to be moved into those secure schools. Because we cannot return students back to those schools that are dilapidated. And if you move them down there, then you have to give all necessary procedures and uh, protocol available to those schools. That is, the schools have to be uh, perimeter fenced. There must be an alarm system. The students and the community have to be trained on how to counter this when it comes. There should be an alarm system to alert everybody. And then, of course, there will be a quick response team not too far away. Hmm. that can come down there at any moment if any school is under attack. The, so the, these the, are this things quick that... This quick response teams, I'm sure that we have... Please don't get me wrong. 
in, in Nigeria, every part of Nigeria, there's so many checkpoints with soldiers, you know, at these checkpoints. So I keep asking every time they say they kidnapped students, they took these number of students. Where do they pass that these security operatives are, that are different checkpoints that are not more than five to six kilometers away from each other? Where are these people? It, it really beats my imagination. And this quick no, response is... your imagination. What? It shouldn't beat your imagination. Really? Because you know, even as a city dweller, if you know that in a particular street or in a particular place, if you are driving in a city like Lagos, you know where the checkpoints are. You know where the checkpoints are. And then, of course, if you feel that maybe your car has some problems and, uh, you know, they will question you, you avoid it. And that is what is happening. So all those uh, checkpoints that are within eyesight, you know, uh, on the highways, they are not there to even look at, look at the uh, kidnapped people. And besides, most of the kidnapped people, from what they've said, they take them right into the deep bush. You know, it is good. They are not following the road. They follow the bush and go. So um, with all the knowledge we have now, you know, response is very, very important. Yeah. Response in the sense that if somebody, like I always say it, if people are kidnapped, we should not allow the kidnappers to rest until mm. we get the students back. Mm. Because they are comfortably taking them, strolling down, you know, children. They will walk with them gradually until they reach where they are going, keep them, and then start to ask for ransom. But if they know that there is hot pursuit, they are following them right behind them. I think they too sometimes will say, this business is getting out of hand. Let's forget mm. it. Okay. Colonel Honda, just before we go, um, uh, Mr. Maki spoke about, um, you know, the issue of arms and ammunition. And I want to ask, what, let's talk about the welfare. He also talks about the fact that it's, it's a war that's been happening over a decade now. Um, is there something being done about, you know, the welfare of these um, officers and men who are in the forefront of fighting this insurgency? Uh, are, are, are they being taken care of? Is uh, everything they need at their disposal? Because if they, you, you can't take a hungry person to fight a war, obviously, he's going to be thinking about his belly. Uh, have the issues of welfare been taken care of in the army? I know you're no longer serving, but of course you do have intel. I didn't, I didn't get your question because it's raining here heavily in Port Harcourt. So All right, I'll ask I again. Didn't... What are we doing in terms of welfare and, you know, the mental health of these men who are fighting in uh, the, the insurgency um, and, you know, the fact that we know that men and the men and officers of the army had complained at some point that they needed certain things to be done for them to be able to win this war. Is that being done right now? You see, uh, the, uh, you, you're talking of welfare of yes. the members of the armed forces that mm. are in, in the Northeast. Mm. Well, uh, the welfare is not good enough because uh, some of their commanders are shortchanging them in the war front. So the issue of, if, if you check, what the man in the Air Force is earning is different from what the man in the Army in the same war, war, war front is earning. So there must be that between between the, uh, the, the the three arms that is the army air force and navy but when you look at it the the the, the, the differ in most ways the navy is earning a different thing the army is earning a different thing the the the, the air force is earning a different thing then you talk of their uniform they are not well treated Oh, I'm so sorry. I think that uh, we have lost Colonel Honda. But I want to say thank you, Colonel Chinedo Honda, is a retired colonel in the Nigerian Army. Um, Mr. Macri is a former DSS Deputy Director. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. We appreciate it. All right. We'll take quickly a report um, because we know that recently uh, there was a report that the Senate Committee recommended uh, the creation of 20 new states. Although it was later denied, Nigerians had something to say about this. We'll take a short break and look at it. And then, of course, we'll wrap up the show right after. Indeed. Presently, Nigeria doesn't need more states. Because all those states we are having now, there's no resources to manage them. 
there's no even a capital to measure that every, every state is sustained with resources they have. Creating more states is like creating more problems and creating more liability for the whole Nigeria. Because, because we are able to create any business, a business in any environment, you must make sure that the one that you have is already sustained. The one you have already have is already grounded and able to support and finance very well. But how many states can be able to boast that they are paying their salary 100%? The state we have is okay. Because we are talking of economy. You are creating a state. What are you going to Even the one we have, we have not given, the government has not funded very well. They don't take care. So it's just that you are, you are giving to more poverty. The one we have, uh, if you go to other states abroad, Americans and the likes, they manage what they have. So the one we have for now, they have not managed it. The one we have right now, we have not been able to satisfy the citizen or the state itself. When you talk of federalism, we're not getting the federalism in the state we have. So when you add more, it's a more burden for the country itself. So if we be able to manage the one we have right now, then we can add more state. But for now, I don't think we are ripe for that. Sorry, I don't think uh, Nigeria needs more state because uh, more state is not the problem of the country. You understand? So making more state will not solve the problem of this country. You understand? But I saw in the social media yesterday or the day before yesterday. Really, if they wonder we are in Tona, we can't manage it well, and they say that uh, additional more state. For my own side, if to say I see uh, the one that we are already having, we are managing well. That is why we should have agitated uh, for more state. But now the one we have, how the economy is and every every what we are facing, like me, I don't think we should try to come back first well before talking of uh, adding another state and order. For my own view, actually, we need more state. Because the way the situation of the country is going now, presently, there are some things we need to put hands together and create more states. So that a lot of people, because especially like Lagos as a whole, the place is shocking up. So if there's any way, like within all this equipment or some other states, they can able to tear it and create more states, at least the place will still expand. We'll see you tomorrow on Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cohn. Have a good evening.